thank you, uh, Emmanuel. Um, so thank you for uh, inviting me, or also, of course, for giving me the opportunity to work on this project. Um, so this is uh, work together with uh, Gerd Benens from the National Bank and Mariana uh, from KU Leuven. And thanks to Gerd, I think I also have to put that disclaimer uh, on the title slide. Um, but anyway, so what is the basic setting of uh, this work? Um, well, of course, given the session, it's about climate change. So um, I think according to estimates, um, over the past decade, uh, temperatures have been on average like one degree Celsius higher uh, than the pre-industrial baseline, uh, according to recent reports. Um, and this uh, increase in temperatures is expected to uh, continue further over the coming decades, of course, dependent of, uh, on the actions taken by governments in order to mitigate uh, this climate change or mitigate the uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, but of course, uh, one uh, effect of this uh, increasing temperatures are more like the, uh, the slow increase of temperatures and related, for example, uh, rises in sea levels, um, which has, of course, adaption costs. But next to that, um, they're also like, I don't know whether this is working, huh? uh, they're also like um, cost of this climate change related to extreme weather events, like uh, floodings, um, droughts, storms, uh, and things like, because these are also likely to increase over time with rising temperatures. Uh, okay. So as an example of this, I, I've taken two examples. Of course, there are many, many examples. Is this like? Okay. Or is it? No. Anyway, uh, there are many, many examples. Um, I've taken two of them. Like one, one paper uh, states that the number of days with very heavy precipitation over Europe has increased by 45% comparing and there's a typo 81 to 2013 with the decades before. Uh, also, another paper has found that the probability of storms uh, in coastal countries, countries in the US has risen fourfold with a one degree Celsius increase in the temperature. Yeah, so really more extreme weather events. And these extreme weather events, they of course also come with, with particular costs. Yeah, so that's one element that will be part of our paper or our work. Uh, another observation that is part of our paper is that the production of goods and services are organized around complex uh, supply chains. Uh, you have seen examples uh, this morning in the excellent presentation by Paul Antras, um, who showed, for example, I think it was of the Boeing Dreamliner, uh, where all the parts of this Boeing were coming from. But it also means that if, for example, the producer of wingtips of this Boeing uh, experiences, in, experiences a negative shock, it will have an impact, uh, of course, on the production of Boeing, uh, but not only on the production of these uh, Boeing Dreamliners, but also on the production of the different parts that are used, uh, in, or the other parts that are used in this uh, Boeing Dreamliner. Yeah? And the extent to which this, uh, this negative shock on the producer of wingtips propagates throughout the network uh, depends then uh, how easily you, these suppliers are replaced, uh, intuitively. Yeah, so, but anyway, so it's, it's the case that with these complex supply chains that the firm level or regional shocks can propagate uh, to have large adverse macroeconomic consequences. Um, now, given this setting uh, of, of um, climate change, it's of course important to know what the economic impact is of these uh, natural disasters. Yeah? So more extreme weather events, more natural disasters, uh, then of course you need to have an estimate of what the economic impact is. Yeah? Because it can guide policymakers in making a cost-benefit analysis of, of uh, different policies that could mitigate uh, climate change. Um, and these economic effects, that was the second point, um, these economic effects of extreme weather events um, are both local effects and also propagated through the supply chain, and these um, can also have important effects outside the region. Yeah, there are a number of examples. Uh, one example is from uh, an academic paper by Bohem and co-authors in 2019 who studied um, the impact of the Japanese earthquake in 2011. And they find, for example, that also U.S. affiliates of Japanese firms witnessed a strong drop in output in response to this Japanese earthquake. Yeah? So they could import less inputs, which were needed for their production process, 
and it appeared that like output decreased one for one with the reduction in inputs because of um, because of the earthquake in Japan. So not only impact in Japan, but also in the US. Another example is uh, Hurricane Helene in the US, so very recent. Um, what is it, one or two weeks ago? Um, should know. Anyway, uh, very recent. Uh, there was a, like a big hurricane in, in uh, the south uh, east of the US. And um, one of the villages that was hit uh, by this hurricane was called Spruce Pine. Uh, never heard of it. It's only a village of uh, less than 3,000 uh, uh, inhabitants. But more importantly, this uh, village is also home to a couple of large uh, quartz mines. And where is this quartz needed for? It's really used uh, in the production of semiconductors and uh, silicon wafers. Uh, and it appears that, there's a statement by, by Conway, so it's rare, unheard of almost, for a single site to control the global supply of a crucial material. Uh, if you want to get high purity quartz, the kind you need to make those crucibles with, without which you can't make silicon wafers, it has to come from spruce pine. Yeah, so it's really a, a crucial input for the semiconductor industry and not easily replaceable because they're the only one who produce this high quality quartz. And then there are of course concerns that like a, a, a negative shock in a very small village and also relatively small mines uh, could have uh, very large consequences for the whole or the world's uh, semiconductor industry. Um, what is this paper going to do? Yeah, so what are, we are going to do, um, as Emmanuel already mentioned, is we're going to look at um, a natural disaster in Belgium, namely the 2021 floods, and we're going to make an explicit distinction between what are the direct economic effects of this natural disaster and uh, the ripple effects uh, throughout uh, the supply chain. Yeah? Uh, in doing so, we're going to look also at um, sources of firm heterogeneity, and, but this is mostly for later work, also investigate what, what supply chain responses uh, there are. Okay. Um, briefly related literature, this reflects also what I said in the introduction, so there's a literature on macroeconomic effects of natural disasters, many, many papers, uh, for example, Noy in th 2009 find uh, substanti substantial macroeconomic effects of natural disasters, especially in developing countries. You have also important work by, by uh, the discussant, which uh, looks at the impact of natural disasters on inflation or on price changes. Um, next to that, you also have a large literature on production networks uh, and its role in the propagation of shocks, uh, to which also people here present in the room, like Emmanuel and I know where Glenn is, somewhere probably. Glenn has also, have also contributed to this a lot, uh, but this literature challenges the idea that microshocks cannot have large macroeconomic uh, impacts. Yeah? And a small, or relatively small literature uh, combines then both of these and uh, that looks at um, how natural disaster, uh, disasters propagate throughout uh, production networks. So again, to the setting, 2021 floods, in case you don't remember, in July 2021, there was extreme rainfall uh, in Western Europe, mostly like um, Eastern Belgium, Western uh, Southwest Germany, uh, and this caused severe floodings. Yeah? So there were over 200 uh, people killed, uh, estimated cost of 10 billion euros for what it's worth, of course. Yeah. So also Belgium has been hard hit. Uh, there was a record rainfall around Liège, over 250 square millimeters on some places, which is, I think, less than, or more than one-fourth of uh, total uh, annual rainfall. 48,000 buildings flooded, 100,000 people affected. And of course, also a lot of damage to transport infrastructure, but also to production uh, infrastructure. Yeah? So this is a map of Belgium. So, so the red dots is uh, where there were some floodings reported, but our paper will be, oops, this is difficult. Um, We'll be mostly focused here on this region, like the flooding of the Vesio, which was the most severe one, uh, and also part of the uh, part of the Uchte. Yeah. Um, we will also focus on the most severely hit communes, so not on all communes where there was some flooding reported, but like the Walloon government, I made a distinction between category one, two, and three. Uh, category one were the most affected uh, communes. Yeah. This was really based on uh, the total damage. Um, that was caused by, by these floodings. Yeah? 
So again, like I said, mostly located in the Vesra Valley, but also part in the in the Oofte. Um Of course, we need some data, and importantly, to look at uh, supply chain uh, effects, um, we also need data on, on transactions between firms, and therefore we are very much held by the, um, the famous um, NBB, or the National Bank of Belgium B2B database, which records uh, the yearly transaction values between all uh, Belgian firms. Yeah, so we have the B2B data really recording or where we observe which firms are connected to which firms through sales and purchases. Uh, and we also have like use a VAT database where we can observe sales on a quarterly basis also for the very small firms. Yeah. We also make use of the so-called crossroad database where we have info on establishments. Yeah. This is important because the VAT and B2B is about firm level data, but of course a firm could have multiple establishments, maybe some of them are located uh, in the flooded areas, other ones. Uh, are not located over there. So we define flooded firms as uh, firms operating in a category one commune and on a radius of 500 meters of a flooded area. Yeah, so the Walloon government uh, gave some data about like which areas were really flooded based on satellite data uh, and we define a firm to be uh, in, or defined to be flooded as it, if it's in a radius of 500 meters of like a uh, flooded area. Third condition is that at least half of the establishments uh, were located in the flooded area. And so just to control for the fact that maybe if a firm is, is uh, located in an area, but maybe all of its establishments are outside the area, we, we drop them. Uh, so this results in 1,249 flooded firms, uh, which are present four quarters before and after the event, and the event like is in uh, the, s the third quarter of... Um, of uh, 2021. Now, was the empirical strategy like we want to we want to tra or track over time um, what sales of these flooded firms are or the direct effects, but of course we just can't look or we can't just look at like how sales are evolu uh, evolving over time because there could be like some seasonal effects that are, that are driving changes from quarter two to three. Uh, maybe also some business cycle effects and so on and so forth. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're using a difference in difference design and we're comparing the change in the flooded firms in terms of sales with the change in non-flooded firms. Yeah, and the basic assumption is that like um, business cycle effects and seasonal effects are the same in the non-flooded firm as the flooded firms. So by then taking the double difference between them, we can isolate the real impact of um, the flooding on these uh, flooded firms. Yeah. Um, at this point, we are only looking at the impact on sales, uh, but also on the probability of exit of the firms. Yeah, because of course, it could be that some firms, they don't only see a drop in sales, but it could also be that they're completely destroyed. It's not worthwhile for them to, to restart business and they will exit the market. Then. Yeah. So that's for the direct effects. We of course also wanna have like these uh, supply chain effects. So we want to measure how the shock uh, propagates uh, throughout uh, or through the supply chain. And we're going to make a distinction between upstream exposure and downstream exposure. Uh, upstream exposure just measures to what extent your suppliers have been flooded. Yeah? So it's just total share of purchases from flooded firm divided by total purchases by a firm. Yeah? So the higher this is, the more of your purchases are uh, from firms that have been flooded and the more likely you have been affected through the supply chain or through the supply chain uh, by this flooding event. Yeah. The same for downstream. Yeah, there we are looking at to what extent you're selling to firms that are active in a flooded area. Yeah, so it's just the total sales to flooded firms divided by total sales. Okay. Um, we can also add higher order linkages, so looking may maybe not only whether you sell directly to a flooded firm, but maybe that you sell to another firm who is then selling to a flooded firm. Uh, we have some first results on that, but I'm, I'm not going to show them uh, today. This is maybe a, a quick graph or a quick picture to, to show how supply chains can matter. Um, so what you see here is like these red dots these are flooded firms. Yeah. 
um, which are of course concentrated in the flooded areas. But the impact or the, or the possible impact is not only constrained to these uh, flooded areas, because of course there are many buyers and many suppliers to these flooded firms, and these are indicated by the blue dots. So they're the buyers uh, from the flooded firms, and the uh, orange dots are the suppliers of these flooded firms. And you can see that they're really spread out uh, over whole Belgium. Okay? Uh, so these supply chain matters, or can matter. Uh, we of course have to estimate whether it matters. Um, and to do that, we again use a difference in difference strategy, but instead of like um, having a measure or dummy variable indicating, okay, indicating um, whether the firm is flooded, we now include the upstream and the downstream measures. Uh, what are the results? Well, first of all, in terms of the direct effects, what do we see? Well, we see that like maybe first before, before the, um, before, the, um, before the flooding event, we see that there appears to be no difference in the change in sales relative to the quarter before the event, which increases confidence in our control group, meaning that like the evolution of sales before uh, the event is the same in our control group as in our treatment group, and the treatment groups are the flooded firms. Um, but then after, um, after the flooding, so here this is the third quarter of uh, 2021, we see a drop in sales of the flooded firms relative to the non-flooded firms by 15%. Yeah, so it appears that on average, sales of the firms active in flooded areas have witnessed a drop of 15% or around 15% in their total sales. Yeah. We see that this negative effect lasts for three periods and then like in the fourth uh, quarter, it appears that like sales go back to the uh, level um, or the pre-flooding level, yeah. or at least it's here in the uh, confidence interval or zero is in the confidence interval. And so apparently a negative impact on sales, and uh, which lasts at least for three quarters. Second, we also look at exit probability. It looks like that firms are uh, more likely to exit if they're in a flooded area after the flooding. Yeah? So there is an increase in the exit probability after the floods. Uh, now, um, moving to the propagation effects. Uh, first of all, Let's look at upstream exposure. Yeah. So again, what does it mean? It looks, uh, it means like to what extent you're buying um, uh, from firms that are active in flooded areas, you know, whether that has an impact on uh, your performance after the flooding. And it really looks that, like that there are significant, significant negative effects of upstream exposure on sales. Yeah. So here the coefficient is equal to minus point, uh, 0.32. Um, to give an idea about what this means in terms of economic impact, uh, so a firm at a 90th percentile um, in terms of their exposure, which is equal to 0.17, witnesses a drop of 5.4% uh, in sales. Yeah? So that's how you can interpret it. Um, now, importantly, here we define this uh, upstream exposure only for firms. Um, that are, um, or, or that have a connection to the, up, uh, sorry, to the flooded firms uh, one and two years before, um, before the flooding as well. Yeah? If we only look at firms that have only short-term relations, relations, or if we include also firms that have short-term relations only one year before, for example, um, then this negative effect goes away, yeah? which indicates that typically the, the firms that have longer run relationships with the flooded firms that they're negatively affected. Okay. So this is for the upstream exposure. Uh, downstream, um, apparently there is no uh, significant impact. Yeah, so down, if we look at downstream, oops. Uh, if we look at downstream exposure, um, there appears to be no uh, significant negative uh, effect. Uh, we don't know why at this point, but it's certainly something to investigate. We don't have a clear explanation. I would expect to see a negative effect both for upstream and downstream, which has also been found in other papers, so we, we need to uh, look into that. 
Um, so finally, we also want to look at heterogeneous effects, um, and we want to see whether the impact varies with firm characteristics. So at this point, we include a couple of um, uh, firm level characteristics. First of all, international activity, uh, namely the share of imports uh, or exports, uh, network diversity, uh, Herfindahl Hirschman index of sellers and buyers in the sector or zip code, but, uh, and also network size. Uh, looking at the results, it appears that like here, share of imports um, amplifies a negative effect of, uh, of the, oops, amplifies a negative effect of the uh, upstream exposure. Yeah, so if you're importing more, it appears that you're more hard, more hard hit um, by uh, suppliers being in the flooded area. And also if you have like here, when your uh, purchases are more concentrated in particular industries, then it, it appears that also your, uh, the impact is, uh, is stronger. Yeah, so it is about heterogeneous effect. Again, for the downstream exposure, there is no, no clear picture. Yeah, everything is uh, insignificant. So to conclude, uh, it appears that the floods in 2021 had a significant negative direct economic impact. Um, which lasted for three quarters. And it also appears that the negative shock uh, propagates throughout the network as buyers of flooded firms are negatively impacted as well. Yeah, but apparently uh, the sellers to flooded firms, they don't see uh, a negative impact. Yeah, so what are the next steps? Uh, we couldn't, or we are planning to introduce a model which would allow, of course, predictions of what would happen with future disasters. It could also allow us to, to uh, assess the macroeconomic impact. So what is the total impact for, for Belgium, for example. Um, to know that, we would have to introduce them all, so we're planning to do that. Um, and we also want to look in detail at uh, network formation, whether maybe linkages uh, are changing uh, after the floods. Okay. So uh, that's uh, about it.